Welcome to the latest episode in this series of EY videos on the implementation of the new LISA standard, IFRS 16, which has become effective this year. The objective of these short videos is to provide helpful reminders during the first year that IFRS 16 is effective, and to share with you some of the latest insights which could affect IFRS reporters. I'm Emily Mole, an Executive Director with the Global IFRS Services Team at EY Global in London. In this episode, we'll discuss some of the interaction between IFRS 16 and IAS 36, Impairment of Assets. I'm joined by Victor Chan. Victor's an International Director at EY Global in London, where he's a member of EY's Global IFRS Services Team, and among others, the Global Leases Subject Matter Group. Victor, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Emily. I'm glad to be here. So, Victor, please can you highlight the major impact IFRS 16 has on accounting for impairment under IS 36? Sure. Under IFRS 16, lessees are required to record right of use assets and lease liabilities in most lease arrangements in their statements of financial position, and right of use assets are required for impairment testing under IS 36. Previously, under the legacy standard of IS 17 leases, no such assets were recognised for operating leases, so there were no operating lease-related assets to be tested for impairment. These lease payments were included in the cash flows of the related cash generating unit or CGU when appropriate. Operating leases were subject to onerous contract provision requirements of IS 37, provisions, contingent liabilities and contingent assets. And when are entities required to perform impairment tests on right-of-use assets? Similar to assets other than goodwill and intangible assets with indefinite lives, a right-of-use asset will only be tested for impairment when impairment indicators with respect to the right-of-use asset or the CGU to which the right-of-use asset belongs exist. When impairment indicators exist, an entity determines whether it should be tested on a standalone basis or whether it will have to be tested at a CGU level. Um, this would largely depend on whether the right of use asset generates largely independent cash flows um, from other assets or groups of assets. While there may be instances where lease assets generate largely independent cash flows, uh, for example in investment property, many lease assets will be used as inputs by the entity uh, for its main operating activities, whether these are related to the production of goods or rendering of services. It is likely, therefore, that lease assets will be uh, subject to impairment testing at the CGU level rather than at the individual asset level. So does that mean that IFRS 16 doesn't affect impairment accounting if there are no impairment indicators? Even if there are no impairment indicators at the right of use asset level or the SGU level, uh, the right of use assets will impact the annual goodwill impairment test by increasing the carrying amount of the CGU or groups of CGUs at which goodwill is assessed for impairment. So one of the most common questions we've received about the interaction between IFRS 16 and IS 36 is how the lease liabilities associated with the right of use assets should be considered when performing impairment assessments. So Victor, what should entities do with these lease liabilities? The recognition of the right of use assets with corresponding lease liabilities has raised questions about the application of the impairment test. The treatment of these liabilities may differ depending on whether the recoverable amount is based on the asset's fair value less cost of disposal or value in use. In general, liabilities are ignored when performing an impairment test of a CGU, meaning that the starting point should be that both the carrying amount of the liabilities and the respective future lease payments would be ignored when determining the carrying amount and the recoverable amount of a CGU. However, there are exceptions to this general rule. This may occur when the disposal of a CGU would require the buyer to assume the associated liabilities. When it comes to the lease arrangement, a CGU would often be disposed of together with the associated lease arrangements. In these cases, the fair value less cost of disposal of the CGU 
would be the sale price of both the CGU and the lease liabilities, less the cost of disposal. To perform a meaningful comparison, the carrying amount of the lease liabilities would then need to be deducted when determining both the carrying amount of the CGU and its value and use under IS 36. From a practical point of view, it may be sufficient to simply ignore lease liabilities and the lease payments when determining the value in use and the carrying amount of the CGU. While this would mean that the value in use is not necessarily comparable to the fair value less cost of disposal, it would not cause an issue as long as the calculated value in use is above the CGU's carrying amount and there is therefore evidence that the CGU is not impaired in line with IS 36. So that's helpful. And there's a short example on the assessment of value in use to demonstrate this point, isn't there? Yes, Emily. For this example, um, consider a CGU consisting of goodwill of 50, fixed assets of 320, and a right of use asset of 133, thus resulting in a total carrying amount of 503. The calculated value in use, ignoring lease cash outflows reflected in the lease liability, is 524. Since there is headroom of 21 in this case, recoverable amount of uh, 524 less carrying amount of the CGU of 503, a comparison by the entity of the value in use and the carrying amount of the CGU ignoring the lease liability would be sufficient. The lease liability in such cases would not need to be deducted from the value in use nor the carrying amount of the CGU, that means the gross basis, uh, if the entity needs to compare the value in use with the fair value less cost of disposal based on a situation where the associated lease liability would be transferred to the buyer. The entity must determine the carrying amount of the CGU, deducting the lease liability and must deduct the lease liability from the value in use as well, which is a net basis. Under either basis, the headroom will still be the same, and this means 21 in this example. So do you have any reminders for entities that carry out an impairment test when the CGU is or contains right-of-use assets? I can think of situations where testing CGUs or groups of CGUs, the cash flow forecasts, including any terminal value, in a value and use model can be longer than the lease term of the right of use assets included in the carrying amount. Where the cash flows of the CGU are dependent on the right of use asset, but the lease term would end during the cash flow forecast period, the replacement of the right of use asset will have to be assumed. How should entities reflect this assumption? This can be done by assuming that a new lease will be entered into and considering the lease payments of this new replacement lease in the cash flow forecast or the terminal value, or by assuming that a replacement asset will be purchased. This would depend on the entity's planned course of action. That's helpful, Victor. So do you expect that many entities will recognise additional impairment charges on initial application of IFRS 16? Generally, we don't expect entities to recognise uh, additional impairment charges simply because of the recognition of right of use assets and lease liabilities on the date of initial application on the adoption of IFRS 16. However, an impairment test is inherently forward-looking and may require significant estimates. Consequently, there may be some effect as a result of including right of use assets and also further refinements can be required to the impairment model applied due to a better understanding of leases. We've come to the end of the fourth episode of this series of EY videos on the implementation of IFRS 16. There are a number of other questions, including those in relation to the application of IS 36, when the cash generating unit includes right of use assets. You can refer to our publication, Applying IFRS, Impairment Considerations when Applying the New Leasing Standard, IFRS 16. And you can read and download a copy of the publication on our website at www.ey.com forward slash IFRS. Thank you for watching. I'm Emily Mole and we will bring you more insights on IFRS 16 in our next episodes. Music